Okay, everybody have their beer? Okay, no hard questions, right? Um, uh, I'm Azmir Mohammed. I run products for uh, Plum Grid. And uh, thanks for joining us. Hopefully there's, there's, uh, there's more um, uh, coming in. Uh, anybody was here for the Walmart session before this? Good, so l low bar for me to, uh, to, to exceed then. Um, so uh, I'm joined today by uh, Tehran. Tehran just uh, uh, joined here from Ixia. And what we're gonna do is really uh, help you uh, understand sort of how we see um, uh, performance and scale testing for clouds. Uh, we see a lot of customers that are moving into production and asking really hard questions about scale and performance. And so we wanted to at least you know, uh, share with you what we've done at PlumGrid and uh, the methodology and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so these, this is my contact info. You can find me on Twitter, same thing for, um, for Tehran. Uh, Tehran looks better in person, by the way. Um, all right, so we're gonna break this up into three sections. Uh, we're gonna cover a quick overview of the uh, Plum Grid ONS architecture. We're an uh, overlay SDN vendor, so uh, helps to put context around um, how we design our products and how it impacts scale and performance. And then we'll, do we'll dive in into scale and then we'll dive into performance. And then I'm gonna hand over to, to, to our technology partner, Ixia, to sort of talk about you know, the Ixia product that uh, can be used to go validate this pure software, uh, really compatible with uh, the testing of clouds. And then we wanna make it interactive. If there are any questions, please put up your hand and uh, let's, get, let's get those answered. All right, so um, cloud networks, um, sort of what we do. Uh, SDN is probably the more common term that's used for, for our products of our type. And the early SDN architecture was very much uh, a, a stack where the, uh, the control plane or the controller was in the path of the packet. And so that was an inhibitor to scale and performance. Uh, it was great because the software defined. It was a new way of doing things. Um, and it worked well, but it definitely didn't um, meet the needs that we, that we felt was needed. So when uh, PlumGrid came around, we wanted to make sure that we had an architecture that was distributed and scalable and performant. And the big difference, as you can see here, if I got, can I do this? Oh, no, sorry, um, is, is that we took the control plane um, out of the, out of the uh, data path. So all the, uh, all the, uh, all the uh, forwarding, which is done in that purple box over there, is done without the need for the control plane to, to uh, uh, intercept, and, and everything is made through an API call. And so this is sort of what we built, and we, uh, Plum has been around since 2011, and so this is what we built and we're applying to our product um, uh, today. And how it looks like physically is you would have uh, what we call the plum grid directors, and that's our control plane, and that's really where you, we would talk to a neutron uh, plugin. So when you, when, you, when you think about neutron plugin, there's a, uh, a uh, plum grid neutron plugin, it is talking to the plum grid director. The plum grid director then is the control plane for all the network functions. So you see there you've got DHCP, uh, a router, DNS, NAT, uh, a switch uh, and a bunch of other things, and it can either be a plum grid or a third party, and those are the virtual network functions. And the network functions get rendered inside what we call these virtual domains, and it's, if you will, it's your, it's your, it's your network container. So each, if one of you, if all of you were on the cloud, each of you would have your own virtual domain, and within there you would render your uh, virtual domain that has your virtual topology. That virtual domain gets rendered on the compute node when a new VM starts up. So you see there's, a, there's VMs of three different colors, blue, orange, and, and black and green. And so when there's a new VM that comes up on, on, uh, for the first time on a host is only the time that the control plane will push down that virtual domain into, that blue, uh, into the IO visor, which is our uh, forwarding plane. And so this, in, at a high level, gives you a view of how we want to provide distributed uh, forwarding uh, because again, we're, we're completely taking the uh, control plane um, out of the way. So when you apply this to, to uh, OpenStack, there's a, there's a significant amount of benefit. So who's familiar with uh, Neutron network nodes? All right, so if you're, you know, if you, if you're not using PlumGrid, if this were a picture from a, from a, a standard OVS uh, setup, you will actually see agents and you'll actually see Neutron network nodes. And what that means is that your, your forwarding is not being done locally. So at some point during the, during the packet forwarding, you'll have to punt your traffic over to the directors or the controllers, 
and then it needs to make a forwarding decision. It sends it back before it gets forwarded. We never do that. So all of our all of our uh, all of our forwarding is done inside the data plane, and then the director only comes in play when uh, when when you need to uh, re define your topology. Uh, part of our demos that we do for customers is actually to kill the directors to show that you can actually run your your uh, uh, packets and, and forwarding without the directors being there, you know, stand apart. So. Um, the control plane is fully redundant because we have them on the, the directors. Um, we generally put the directors inside the controllers for your OpenStack cloud. They're all in Linux containers, so they can run anywhere. But generally, best practice is to put them on the on the uh, controllers. Um, because forwarding is done on each compute node, every single time you add a compute node, the uh, the capacity for your cloud increases. The forwarding capacity for your cloud increases. And then, um, and then since we don't have to punt traffic to the directors, uh, uh, the VM to VM packet flow is very optimized. Right. Any questions on the architecture? Cool. All right, so let's talk a little bit about virtual domains. So um, how we came out with virtual domains, we actually pioneered this technology uh, when, when we started as a company. Um, and it's gotten so, uh, so popular that we've actually uh, seen it used by, by other vendors to, ex to explain this, this uh, concept of, of, this, um, of, of your private uh, network container, we actually got inspiration from from a VM. So if, if those of you familiar with the VM, it's uh, you're abstracted out from physical hardware, and what you have in there generally is the OS and and an app, and you have it in there. So we wanted to apply that same uh, construct to networking because we saw a lot of benefits there. All right, you have the software software only container, uh, you get a lot of benefits around portability. You're completely decoupled from the hardware, so you can run a pure overlay network. And it's a logical representation. So this was the thing. We still needed to provide a view that made sense to somebody who's a network administrator. Router, bridge, firewall, load balancer, those things are still there. And you still connect them in some logical manner. But we render it in software. You're not, you're not limited by what you can do in, in physical. And then the benefit is you can create, copy, and clone, which is very much what you do in most cloud operations anyway. And so this is, for us, a really a, a, a cornerstone of our technology and our value, value add. And within the virtual domain, we have these virtual network functions. And so these are our, uh, you know, what you would be familiar with in the physical world that we render in software. So all of these things here, when you, you, when you put them in a virtual domain, uh, you can connect them, you can manipulate them and whatnot. And then when you're ready to use them is when you say, you know, render it. And then as you bring up a VM, these functions get rendered inside that data plane inside each compute node, right? Pure software. Uh, and then the nice thing is, we're, we're, I'm showing here all the Plumgrid virtual, um, virtual network functions. You can also add to this any third-party virtual network functions. So you can service change, change things in. All right, so um, IOVisor, which is our programmable data plane, is in kernel. Uh, everybody know the, the difference between user space versus kernel space? Right? Kernel space, run faster. I just remember that. So we, we spent a lot of time and effort upstreaming um, uh, IOVisor into the, uh, into the Linux kernel. And so that's paying dividends now. And that gives us you know, it's really ultimate software forwarding performance. Uh, security at scale. So virtual domains, by default, are, are secure. Each one of us gets uh, our own virtual domain. And that is your private network. Nobody else can, can tap into it. Um, natively multi-tenant, right? So this fits in well with OpenStack and any shared infrastructure uh, type of environment. And then because we do everything in, in, uh, locally inside the IOVisor, our throughput grows with each new compute node that you add. And so you'll see here in terms of the scale that we see is truly additive, highly efficient, right? There's no punting to a, a neutron network node. Everything is done inside the uh, IOVisor. And then the control plane is completely decoupled from the data plane. Gives us a lot of benefits there. All right, so let's talk about what we do around scale and performance. So um, you know, as, as, a, as a company, we've had to go through different phases where we're going through creation of the technology to begin with, and then integrating into various uh, pieces, both in the underlay, in the physical environment, VXLAN offload, for example, and also into the OpenStack distributions. Right. So we've, we're beyond that. We, as I mentioned earlier, we started in 2011. And now we actually have customers going into production. And so there's been a renewed uh, emphasis at PlumGrid to really dig down in terms of scale and performance because our customers are asking us for it. So we went ahead and you know, in the lead up to Vancouver, really dedicated a team here. There's actually more than the, the folks that are on in, in, this, in this page uh, here. 
uh, and really to try to do two things. One is to get the updated numbers. Right? We felt that it was time for us to sort of share, be more transparent around what we can do. Um, and then also wrap that into our, 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 our standard release methodology. Right? We've, we've got to be able to maintain or exceed a certain baseline with every software release that we come out. Right? So we know OpenStack revs every six months. We want to make sure that as OpenStack revs or as we rev, we're maintaining the same number or higher. And that can only happen where you're putting in an investment and you have a methodology that, that is repeatable. So, um, and we, we've done this via uh, CapEx uh, spend on the infrastructure side, and also we, we do a lot of our testing, scale testing, on the public cloud, because it's much easier for you to spin up 1,000 nodes in the public cloud than it is for you to spin up 1,000 bare metal servers, right? Uh, and, and the numbers are, are, very, are very clear there. So definitely a focus for us. So when we look at scale, there's really three main components that sort of, you know, that, that's, that's important to us. One is the number of compute nodes, right? That is a direct proxy of how big your cloud is, right? The number of instances that you can run and whatnot. The second is gonna be tenants and instances, right? There's gonna be a correlation between the number of instances. And so that's what we focused on in terms of how to determine scale, are, those, are these three uh, uh, axes. And, but we also wanted to make sure that this was something that was repeatable, right? So remember when I talked about directors? So that's a cluster, and a cluster starts with three, and you can grow beyond that. We wanted to see how far we can push ourselves using our minimum HA director size, which is three. So everything that you're going to see in terms of scale here is sort of based around a setup of three directors, and a director is just a, you know, it's a container that runs on an x86 server. Um, we have some recommendations in terms of RAM and whatnot, but really it's, it's fairly lightweight. And so we wanted to see how there, and then as customers um, exceed the numbers, then we'll decide whether we need to beef up the directors or recommend a reference architecture that increases the number of directors, right? But we wanted to start with three. All right, so what did, what did, the, what did the numbers say? The numbers said that we could, um, we, we tested up to 1,000 compute nodes. Um, and, um, and what that means is that a lot of customers today are just beginning their journey on OpenStack. And, and, but they, and what we've seen with clouds is that once you get started, that explosion starts, you know, it, it, goes, it goes fairly rapidly. And so we want to make sure that if you start today with three directors, you can go a long, long, long way before you have to redesign your, your cloud, if at all. And so 1,000 compute nodes is sort of what we saw. Um, and really is one of these things where, you know, back to the neutron network nodes, there is no need for you to think about these things, right? You're safe to go with the reference architecture uh, of three directors and two gateways and, and, as, and up to 1,000 compute nodes. So that's generally what we're recommending to customers. And this, again, gets us, you know, very, very far um, down the road. So no need for agents, uh, HA and, and uh, uh, network nodes to worry about as you scale up. So the second thing was around uh, you know, tenants and instances. And so again, we wanted to make sure that we could get to a number that was, you know, that, that get, gets us further out. Um, we, you know, we frankly ran out of time. We could have gone further on this, but we, we, when we reached 10,000 tenants and 20K instances, we felt that it was time for us to cap it now, but we'll continue to exceed this. Hopefully by the time we get to Tokyo, um, we'll, we'll get there. The, uh, just the, to, to double click on this, so we did the testing here with you know, fairly straightforward uh, topologies. Um, and, and as you see, there's a, there's a mix here. Effectively, we had two instances per tenant. That's how, that's how we, we got to this number. Uh, we could have, you know, we're going to go in and, and have more sophisticated mixes because we know that not everybody's going to have the same topology all the time. Right, but we're fairly confident that if, even as you slice and dice this into different mix of, of, of sizes per virtual domains per tenants, that you'll be able to still get to the same number um, uh, at, at the end. So that was, that was good, but a lot of times when we run into networking, uh, people want to know about connectivity outside of the zone. So before that, you know, if you go back before this, it was just, hey, it's number of tenants, number of instances, and whatnot. What about if I had to go outside? What if I got a floating IP? So when you get a floating IP in OpenStack, you're effectively doing a NAT. And that's both uh, yeah, in, uh, in, inward and, and out, so source and destination. If you look at a, a, uh, a typical OpenStack design today that uses uh, neutron network nodes, uh, either NAT is done in a neutron network node, 
So everything needs to go through the network node before it goes out, or you're going to split. Even with DVR, you split source and uh, destination NAT. Uh, with PlumGrid, all of those are still done inside the, um, inside the uh, IOVisor. And we actually did this at a customer site. So we actually went on site, we installed this on their infrastructure, and that screenshot that you see here is actually a tool that we have. So we've got this uh, the set of tools called PlumGrid Toolbox, and one of the things that we have in there is called a NAT inspector. And you can actually, in real time, run the tool to sort of see how many connections you're getting um, inside, inside the system. So that's what we did. We actually went on site to them. Uh, I think this was maybe a week ago that we did this uh, and ran this on their infrastructure. And we got to, and this was the goal that they set for us. They wanted to see 100,000 NAT connections running using our software, and, and we got this done. Um, we haven't done a competitive analysis here, but we feel very confident that this is much higher than any SDN vendor uh, out there. All right, I'm going to pause there because that gets us to a summary of scale. Any questions that people have here around compute nodes, virtual domains, tenants, and instances, plus the, uh, the NAT flows? Well, you guys are easy. Um, so the one. Yeah, so, uh, so what we did was we, 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 we spun up the instances, we created the flows. And then we, we, once we got to 100,000 flows, we ran it for 90 minutes okay. and, and sustained. Okay. And can you also comment on the east-west traffic? Yeah, so let's go back to the doctor. Good question, by the way. So, so when using, and so you use the word east, west, north, south, and that's a you know, nomenclature we use also. So uh, east, west is when you're talking VM to VM, right, within the zone, and then north, south is when you're going in, in and out of the zone. So a NAT test is a proxy for nor north, south traffic, right? And then east, west is that, that throughput number. That, uh, so we'll cover throughput, but throughput generally is a good proxy for, uh, for uh, east, west, because you're not really doing any sort of IP address translation because you're within the zone, right? You're encapsulating in VXLAN and you're sending it out. So, so we're, generally, we're not worried about uh, east-west because that can run fairly fast. You can do offload. What you were more worried about is north-south. But as a percentage of traffic, depending on how you, you, you've got your, uh, your, um, your apps and environment set up, you could actually have applications that never have to talk to the internet, right? It's a database server talking to uh, middleware. It go is going east-west. Or you could have a, uh, a web server that's always talking north-south, right? So, that, so for us, it's very important to sort of give you a view into, into both of those. Okay. And can you uh, give us a sense as to how many networking hops you have for this question? So the network hops. So for the, um, let's see here, let's, for all of these, the, 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 the measurement was purely around, can you bring up these virtual domains inside, inside, your, inside your zone, right? So it was like, bring up uh, your, your IF, uh, your interface is, is up and running, and you can ping packets, right? So it was not a test of performance, uh, so that's a test of scale. I think for NAT, it was more sort of a hybrid of your testing scale, and you're also testing flows, right? Going, going in and out. So that's a, that, that's a mix. We do have performance coming through, but I want to make sure that we cover scale here before we transition to the next one. Good, good, good questions. Yep, sir. So, so the, the NAT flows, what kind of traffic were you guys uh, testing? Can you get some of the ICP stuff, or are you guys testing the TCP? I believe it was TCP. Okay. Yeah, yeah, TCP. OK. All right. Cool, all right. So. So, so scale, and we'll, 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 we'll do more here, but this generally, when we talk to customers, people want to find out, these are the main things people want to know about how they scale their OpenStack cloud. Um, one thing to note, what I covered here are numbers for networking. As you know, in a cloud, you have compute and you have storage. And, and, and all three of those could be a limiter for the size of your, of your, of your cloud. But we want to make sure that we're not the, we're, 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 we're not the lowest common denominator. Career cloud. OK, so let's go into performance testing. So performance testing, you sort of have to like take off the scale hat and put on a different hat. It's a very different uh, view of the world. So uh, and, and, and Tehran will cover more because he's, he's, you know, he spends a lot of his, a lot of his uh, uh, working life 
focused on networking equipment and how, how it's done there. But let me just you know, apply sort of cloud constructs here. So one is any cloud performance that you test will always be CPU bound, plain and simple, right? Virtual machines are going to be CPU bound. Um, and if you test on lower grade hardware, you will get lower performance, guaranteed. You test on better hardware, you'll get better performance, guaranteed. So that's the one thing. If you're going to do this and you need to measure the, your, your cloud, it, there's a direct correlation between the numbers that you get and the type of hardware that you use. Okay, so it is, it is an investment. We made the investment because we, we, we need, this is our business. But if you're going to do this at home, quote unquote, then just make sure that your hardware is good. So what should you be looking for? So definitely, um, you know, so modern CPU. So we did an, I think we used an E5 Intel, right? So you're using an i, i5, i7. You're, you're, you're using a desktop class CPU, right? You want to use, you want to use something at server spec. Um, CPU, right? The frequency, so the higher, the higher gigahertz count, the better you're going to get. Um, you can actually go in and lock. So if you're actually going to do this testing, you're going to get very variances if it's not locked. And then the, the VM, right? So if you're using, if you're overloading the number of VMs per core, then you will get uh, obviously l lower performance. And when you when you'll see here, it's when you measure performance in the cloud, you're measuring between uh, with, within pairs as you go over the link. But this is this is probably the most important thing. Right? The guy that helps us do this at at um, in, at Plumgrid, this is like you know this is what he does. You know, the first four questions he asks us is about is about hardware. Um, RAM and the RAM spec counts, but not as directly as CPU. So what we've seen is that you know so we, we actually load up our um, our uh, distributed hash table is actually loaded up inside memory. So when you know so just to play play through our architecture, when you first bring up our cloud, there's a config file that's on disk, and then we load that config file into into memory, and that config file pretty much is what with those virtual domains we talk about. All of that is in RAM, and that's how it gets downloaded. So the more RAM you have, the bigger you know the, the 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 bigger table you have to build this this, and so that that helps. And then the higher RAM spec allows us to go to go do this. And so this helps as you bring up the VMs, how quickly we can uh, re uh, render the apologies and whatnot. Um, the next one, frankly, I don't know what that means other than my engineer told me to go put it in. So if someone knows what vhostNet uh, enable means, then let me know. But otherwise, just note that as you as you as you measure. Right? He is right. OK, good. He's right. Um, so and then and I think in this day and age, if, you're, if you want high performance and you're, you won't expect that in software forwarding, I think, I think that's naive. To, to, you know, to, 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 uh, it's, it's like, using, it's like uh, building um, a data center using you know, old chips that don't have uh, virtualization enabled. Right? You just, you just got to leverage any, anything that you have in your hardware to, to offload this. And so with, uh, with the way that you build out scale out uh, data centers, right? if you've got a CPU that is doing processing for compute and also doing processing for networking, that means that you're going to get much lower density on the compute side because you're spending a lot of time processing, processing uh, network traffic. And so using VXLAN offload NICs, you know, we, I, I love them because you know, for that investment, it pays dividends because you get more bang for the buck in terms of um, does a compute power, but if you end up use, if you can't use a VXLAN offload, then you definitely want to make sure that you know you turn on UDP RSS to I mean, do the measurements. All right, so let's see how we how we did this. We did this simple. I didn't build a thousand a thousand node compute cluster to go test performance. Uh, I just built two nodes and then I tested the performance between them. So this is effectively the ability for you to sort of offload things onto the NIC, send the packet over the wire, and sort of see how far you can, you can get done. And then we just distributed the VMs across the two nodes and saw how fast we can saturate the link. And this is what it looked like. So um, start with, OK, so we used 9,000 byte messages. That was the, the two servers that we used. And we used the Mellanox uh, network card uh, to offload. and then. As you, as you can see, um, the numbers grow as you get closer and closer to the number of pairs. And it's because, back to that CPU, you can saturate the link and the core at low numbers. So that's why with a single, a single pair, you can't get to 36, right? It's, it's not possible today. Um, so so as, you, as you go closer, this is where it's additive. Is there a question, sir? 
uh, two different compute nodes. So the VMs were, so the pair would be one on one and one on two. And then we just, yep, exactly. This is how we measured it. So we did this in a single, single virtual domain. So this is a single tenant. And we and we and we did we did this. We didn't have time to go do the the variation where we had one virtual domain uh, on on one host and another virtual domain on the other and do this. But so this was the the test that we did right here. Yep, sir. Yeah. So you know, so I brought that up because I actually had originally said packet size, and my engineer said no, no, it's it's uh, it's messages. So we did. Um, uh, so it is effectively an MTU of 9,000, right? That's, that's effective, but I was told the terminology is messages, not MTU. There was a question on this side? Yeah, uh, how many ports did you have to across? Yeah, it was identical across, uh, and I'm trying to remember here, for this server spec, it was 10 cores. So we, had, uh, we still had extra cores available, but we were saturating the link anyway. So, yeah, one core per VM. Yeah, that's best practice. I think if you can if you can do more than one core per VM, then you then you're good. But we figured the baseline is that you have a single core per VM. So that was the testing that that was done here. All right. So then we said, okay, so we did that with nine thousand. How does it look like for for smaller packet sizes? So this is what it looks like for nine, fifteen hundred, and and five twelve. You sort of see this, this, you know, this natural. You know, you 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 saturate the link earlier on. It's fairly consistent. You get much better throughput, obviously, for the larger uh, message sizes. But it's not that far off as you see as you see this for the lower packet sizes. It's fairly efficient. Um, it ramps up, and then we fairly saturate around the five to six pairs on this hardware, and then we, we get there. So how, how do you how should you read this? Right? There's a lot of data here. So obviously. Um, the, the difference between a 9K byte and 1500 byte after you, know, after you saturate the link is, is, is minimal, right? It's, uh, it's greater with a smaller uh, with small number of pairs, but after that, it's there. So it's fairly efficient in terms of what you can do for, for packet processing. Uh, second thing is that there is still performance gains that we can, that we can reap. So I mentioned earlier that we, had, we, had, uh, we used IOVisor as our data plane, and we had, we had um, upstream that. Uh, uh, to the Linux kernel. So we're going to constantly try to get more optimization done to close the gap between what you see on the bar to where that, where that yellow line is, right? I don't know how close we'll get, right? But that's something that, you know, as a as company, we pride ourselves and want to go uh, get that done. Um, and, then, and then if we were to use, you know, so this hardware here, it's not the best hardware you can find in the in on the market. There's better ones now, and so we'll 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 get better ones. And the expectation is that um, we'll get bigger throughput because we'll need more pairs to saturate the link. Right? The the hardware can can do more. Yeah, sir. Just wanted to clarify, was this the east-west? This was uh, east. Yes, this is east-west. So we we're going from VM to VM. Right. Um, so you bring up a good question. Hey, what's the performance numbers for north-south? Right. So, and I'll, I have to go into the, the product pitch. So, for we, so when you go um, north-south, you're going through what we call our gateway. And when, what happens in the gateway is, is that you would actually encapsulate and de-encapsulate de VXLAN. Um, the gateway can be a software gateway. So, it's our software running on an x86 server. Or it could be a hardware gateway. It could be a switch from Arista and Cumulus. So, the switches run really, 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 really fast, right? Uh, that NAT that I was showing earlier, that is not done on the gateway. That NAT uh, translation is done in IOVisor. Right. So the performance, if you were to just measure, if, you were to, if I were to put a VM, uh, let's say if I, I had a gateway between these two servers, right? Um, They'll, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's not. It's going to be an order of magnitude or more of the NAT flow number that, that I showed you. So this is the this is the theoretical max. So this tells me that today we've got still improvement gain, improvements that we can make inside our inside our forwarding architecture. So we're we, you know we're going to do that. We're going to optimize it. There's a lot of tricks that we can that we can use. There's changes in the Linux kernel that's happening. And so there's more there, but if you see here we're you know even at you know at the largest we're about we're about 90% of the theoretical max today. 
right? How close to that max? You know, obviously we want to get to identical. We want to get to the theoretical max, but that's that's what we need to go work on and try try to capture. But even today, uh, it's a highly efficient forwarding uh, engine. All right. Good question. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Um, definitely want to spend more time later on if there's specific questions you have around there. I want to pass this on to Tehran to talk about XCR and how. You know how uh, it, people use you know open source tools and whatnot. But that, that's great, but there are also tools that are very compatible to use for uh, performance testing in the cloud. Thank you. Thank yep. <coughs> okay, I'll try to um, be brief. We've got about ten minutes, uh, and I want to leave some time for Q and A. Uh, first, a little bit about Ixia. Ixia started its journey about about 18 years ago as a network test and measurement company, um, selling uh, solutions to equipment manufacturers, their customers, carriers, service providers, and enterprises. And uh, fast forward to now, we've, um, we're, we're an, a, a customer advisor and technology services provider. Um, we really focus on improving application delivery in any of the infrastructure that you have and security resilience of that entire infrastructure. So really focused on improving that experience for a customer. Um, but today, uh, and, and some of you may know I, uh, Ixia as a hardware test company, and, and that used to be the case a long time ago, and a number of our products that, have, that were purely on hardware uh, for the purposes of testing switches and routers at that time have been now virtualized for the modern uh, you know, cloud-centric infrastructure. So practically everything at Ixia uh, that's available in, on hardware is actually available in virtual. Um, but the one I want to talk briefly about a little bit in a dig deeper is Ike's Chariot, and I'll call it Chariot once in a while. It's an all software solution. Um, the way it works is um, it's actually intention is for troubleshooting and performance testing of virtual infrastructure. So there is a web console that you deploy um, in your environment. It could be on the management side. It could be in band uh, with where your production network is going to be. And um, so that's the console that actually is responsible for creating the test topologies. It's responsible for getting all the data from all the distributed locations and actually providing real-time uh, stats that you can look at. Um, the workhorse of the product is uh, what we call uh, performance endpoints. In the, and I put down 980 kilobytes, and that applies to practically all the Linux distributions, 32-bit or 64, that you would actually deploy on any flavor of Linux that you have. It could be a VNF that you have. It could be an instance of Linux that you prefer to use. And you would actually distribute them and install them wherever you have servers, domains, instances that you want to actually get performance metrics from. Um, we talked a little bit briefly about floating IP. Um, this product is net friendly, meaning we can we actually initiate all the traffic from uh, behind a firewall, so we can actually traverse one hop, multiple net uh, boundaries very easily. And I'll talk a, a little bit briefly about that. And all the, the application traffic that we actually model in the product is state aware. So all the data applications are TCP. They're stateful. They actually are the, what the customers would be using. Um, and then also streaming and UDP traffic. So a little bit more on uh, the distributed endpoints. So they, are, like, as I mentioned, install on, uh, on VMs or any existing VNF function. So you can imagine you can have a plain vanilla Linux system. You may have a switch. As a VNF, you can actually, as long as it's running Linux, you can actually put the endpoint directly in that environment. Uh, so you can actually validate that infrastructure. Um, it uses the actual network stack and the transport for sending and receiving all the traffic. So in effect, it's actually you're able to validate the OS, all the parameters that it may have by default, the way the, the vendor shipped it, uh, the container essentially, and the transport of it. Um, and then it uses IP, IP connectivity across. And so what that means is that it doesn't matter where the endpoints are. You can have endpoints in uh, behind uh, as, a, as a fixed IP. You can actually have um, endpoints that are actually outside the floating IP boundary. And uh, we use dynamic pinhole technologies to actually get to those endpoints from the console and actually construct tests that actually can go east-west across the mains, even if it's knotted, uh, east-west or north-south, uh, even if that's knotted. So it's actually meant to not have you configure any rules uh, to be able to reach the endpoints, regardless of where they are. So I kind of highlighted that here. We uh, traverse the stacks, TCP, UDP, RTP, of that given operating system. Any stack settings uh, on the network that are there by default, we don't touch. So you're actually testing the real thing. 
and uh, it'll run on any environment. So in, the, in, this, in this case, we're talking about virtual, but it'll actually run on any LAN or WAN as well. Um, after you set up all the distributed endpoints, typically you would actually create topologies in the product, and it's meant to be the way you have it. So if you wanted to have a three-tier application or you had um, servers in one instance in one domain talk to the other, that, that's what we call logical topologies. You'd create that in the, in the, in the product uh, by way of defining which endpoints are on which side, and then you define the type of traffic that you want to have. It could be small packets, large packets, the ones that we were just looking at. You can define how many simultaneous TCP flows are actually being uh, generated from one to many, many to one, uh, just based on the, the type of logical topology that you might have. So as an example, you saw 100,000 flows. That would mean maybe you want to have one endpoint that actually is responsible for all 100,000 uh, connections to be initiated and you want to distribute them on 10,000 different destinations, you can actually model that as an example of a topology. It just is a function of how your, your actual end-to-end -end network is. And then once you have that set up, um, once you run a test, it's all in real time, so you actually get flow metrics for every one of them. So you can actually see degradation in performance from every instance to every other instance that you have set up. Um, a quick, uh, uh, I'll touch on briefly um, earlier, uh, as Amir talked about, a lot of the network performance. Obviously, we test the network, regardless if it's virtual, if it's switching out to a, a top of rack infrastructure and back into another one, or any combination. But we also, uh, and customers use this a lot, where they actually want to max out and figure out what the limits are of X number of cores in, an in a given physical infrastructure. So. Um, we have pretty large systems that run, and I wanted to indicate a lot of times customers will run a fully loaded system. This one happens to have 24 cores fully dedicated to, to multiple 40 gig interfaces on the actual um, hardware. Um, and we can actually push out more than 100 gigabits of traffic through all of those cores. And the, and the idea is to see where, at what point uh, are all the cores busy, and at what point have you reached the boundary of the interface itself. And, and what does that look like from the CPU user standpoint? So we actually can let you see both at the same time by doing so. Okay, so looking ahead, uh, as we work closely with PlumGrid, we're gonna develop some test methodologies to highlight performance in various scenarios that, that you might have in your network, north, south, uh, east, west. We'll create some traffic modeling uh, that is actually based on the overlay technology that you might have. And uh, we'll, we'll be actually creating some of the uh, benchmark flows so that actually they are part of a solution that you get. And we're hoping to actually create these test scripts in our products so that actually they can be actually pushed out. And anyone looking to model this type of traffic has a repeatable way of doing that. Okay. I know I kind of ran through everything very quickly, um, just in the interest of time, but. Um, yes, I think, you know, I think we're, we're towards the end here. And I think we're, what we want to go do is really bring some you know, some repeatability around uh, testing methodology here. So you know, obviously, you know, for us, you know, just you know, plug for, for ONS, we really feel that we've got a high, you know, highly scalable, highly performant uh, platform. Uh, we're going to continue to, um, to update these numbers and publish them to make it available to you. But really, the, the cornerstone of all of this is our architecture that's fully distributed. Um, I think the ability for us to do forwarding in kernel allows us uh, a leg up on a lot of other solutions in this space that use you know user space forwarding that's not as performant. And then what we want to go do is as we as we work with uh, with Ixia here is really to provide this test to you to you uh, for you to validate by yourself right. Uh, what one thing we want to make sure is that we're doing an apples to apples comparison. I think you can only do that when you have a a well understood methodology and a tool set that is available right to, to folks to go to go do. So um, hopefully this, is, this has been uh, beneficial for folks. We'll, uh, if there's any questions, we'll answer them here in, in the forum. Or if you've got one-on-one -on -one questions, we'll hang out uh, yeah. after the presentation. A any questions here before we, we finish up? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.